as pastor said, I, I actually, you know, teach on the court of heaven. And, and it's like if I go somewhere and, and I think I want to teach on something else, I'm like, I dare not. Because, because everybody wants to know, you know, another idea, another concept out of this particular teaching. And as he was sharing, that's exactly right. I mean, this, this message actually changed my life. It, it completely reordered and changed my life because I was in a desperate place where I'd been a man of prayer since 1980. I knew that when God called me to the ministry, or I knew I, was, I knew I was called long before that, but when I surrendered to the ministry and said yes, the thing that I surrendered to more than preaching was praying. That was just true. It was just, I knew that, that I, I was, this is what I knew. I knew I was limited in ability. And some people say, but you're, you're, you can speak pretty well. Well, back then I could not. Okay, so I was really limited in ability. And, and at least that's the way I saw myself. I saw myself kind of like the one talented man uh, that didn't have a whole lot to offer, but knew God was calling me. And so I began to pray. See, out of necessity, I began to pray. I thought, okay, there's other people that have tremendous giftings. They don't seem to need, need to pray as much or they don't think they need to pray as much. But I knew that if I was going to have any kind of an effect or any kind of a, a, a result, I was going to have to pray because I knew that that was absolutely essential to whatever God had for me. So I felt this genuine, legitimate call to prayer more than to preach. So I just began to pray. So from 1980 on, I did that. But then in about 2008, nine, maybe it was, all of a sudden it didn't seem like my prayers worked anymore. I don't know if you've ever gone there. I mean, I learned a lot of things about prayer because I'd been doing it for what, almost 30 years by that time. And I learned a lot of stuff, but then it was like everything just stopped working. And our lives began to fall to pieces. I mean, everything around us. I mean, I mean, my, our kids, me and Mary thought at one time, that's my wife, Mary. We've been married for 47 years. And my wife, Mary, and I thought at one point we must be the worst parents that ever lived. Because our kids that we had raised in church and raised in the Lord and all that, they were all, they were doing crazy stuff. And it was like, what is wrong with you people? You know better than that. And so all this was going on. Here's what I discovered. Here's what I discovered. The reason they were doing that was because there was a covenant with a demon in my bloodline that I knew nothing about. There was a covenant with a demon in my bloodline. And this is what I discovered. When there is something like that working against you, it gives the enemy the legal right to claim you and your lineage. Because covenant is generational. And so it gives, you, it gives the enemy the legal right to claim it. And that's why our kids, we have six of them, we're all doing crazy stuff that we would have never, I mean, they were, you know, four of them were kind of at the early stages of adulthood. The other two were still in high school, but they were all just doing, doing stuff, messing up. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing, some of you know this, there's nothing as painful as watching your kids make wrong choices. And there's nothing as painful as watching them choose the wrong path and knowing that unless they turn, unless they change, they're going to end up in great sorrow. They're going to end up in a, a real place of, of hurt and sorrow. So we were praying and all these kind of things, but nothing seemed to be working. At that point, God began to reveal to me the court of heaven. And he began to show me, he began to show me um, these issues that the enemy had legal claims from. So let me just tell you how that happened. So I got invited to South Africa. And I went to South Africa, and I was speaking at the conference. And when I got to the conference, the lady that was hosting the conference, here's what she said. She said, um, we want to cleanse your bloodline. And I'm, I mean, I looked at her and said, uh, excuse me, I'm an American. What's wrong with my bloodline? I didn't say that. I said, what's wrong with my bloodline? And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. You don't understand. She said, when you stand on my platform, you're going to be speaking to many different nations in Africa. There's many different people from many different nations. And this is what she said. If there's anything legal in you or your bloodline, the devil's coming after you and your family. And when she said that, this was honest to goodness, not trying to be funny. This was the first thought I had. I've got American demons after me. I don't need African ones after me too. And so I looked at her and I said, please 
cleanse my bloodline. So they took me into a room. I didn't even know what they were talking about. They took me into a room and they had me pray this prayer. Lord, I open my bloodline up before you. And if there's anything in my bloodline that would give the enemy legal right to come after me and my family, would you just reveal it? Well, there was this little seer gift that nobody would know who she is, but she was phenomenal. And she said, I see that someone in Robert's bloodline made a covenant with a demon god named Parax. And even the people that knew this woman looked at her like, what are you talking about? She said, I see it. She said, she said there was a demon god named Parax that Robert, somebody in his bloodline made a covenant with. And they said to her, spell it. So she spelled it P-A-R-A-X. They pulled the computer out and began to Google Parax. Well, as they Google Parax, here's what came up. A demon god whose chief characteristic is to suck dry. Whenever they said that, it was like a, it was like a light bulb came on. I mean, I suddenly understood the reason my prayers aren't working anymore. The reason they're not operating and having an effect is because there is a, there is a covenant in my bloodline with demons that's giving him a legal right to work against me, my family, my children, and everything else that I count dear. I just instantly knew that. And they led me in a really simple prayer of, of Lord, I repent, I renounce, and this is a critical piece, I give back. I give back anything that demon God says that I have gained from it. Because here's the reason that people would make covenants with demons. They would only make covenants with demons because they're trying to gain something. I mean, way back, they might have made a covenant because they needed rain for their crops. Or they made covenants because they wanted protection. Or they made covenants because they, they wanted some kind of deliverance or, or victory in warfare or whatever it might have been. That they would make covenants with, with demon powers out of ignorance quite often because they wanted the supernatural empowerments to be able to work in their behalf. And so, so as, uh, and you can find this, by the way, in Isaiah chapter 28 in verses 14 and 15, where that the, the leaders of Israel, the scornful men of Israel, actually made a covenant with Sheol and with Hades. And they said they made it. Here's why they made it. They said they made it so that when the overflowing scourge comes, it won't touch us. In other words, they made a covenant with demons for protection. But here's what you got to understand. Somebody in my bloodline made a covenant with that. So it wasn't just enough to repent, and I've just really gotten a hold of this principle. It wasn't just enough to renounce and revoke. I also needed to return. I needed to say to that, in, into the spirit world, I give back anything this thing says I have gained. Now, why would I do that? Because covenants are made out of trades. Everybody say trades. See, in, um, in Genesis 21, Abraham approaches Abimelech and he gives him seven, seven ewe lambs and the Bible says he made a covenant with Abimelech by giving him. So he traded, here's what he did, he traded those ewe, seven ewe lambs and as a result, he got recognized ownerships of the wells that had been dug. But the transaction happened because a trade was made. See, so, so here's the deal. Demons want us to make trades. Somebody in our, in our family line might have made a trade with demon powers, which created a covenant which allows demons to claim ownership. See, it's trades producing covenants that create ownership. And, and this is what happens in our family lines. We, there was a trade made that created a covenant that allows the enemy to claim your kids or whatever it is that you count dear. So whenever they led me in a prayer, they said, you know, you repent. Lord, I repent for whatever happened in my bloodline. Let me explain that for just a moment. When you repent for activity in your bloodline, you're not securing forgiveness for those people. Their own lives determine their eternal state and destiny, whatever, however, how they live or lived or live. 
Watch, here's what it does. When you repent in their behalf, it revokes the enemy's legal right to use that against you. See, that's what, that's, that's what it does. It, 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 it allows the devil's legal rights to be revoked so that the enemy can't use that against it. Because I've had people come to me and say, wait, wait, my, my grandparents are still living and they're, they're, still, they're still godless. They're not serving God. I said, it doesn't matter. They said, so do we have to repent every time they sin? I said, no. I said, you go before the courts, you repent for them and their bloodline, and you ask that the legal right the enemy is claiming to use that against you be revoked and be removed. And that's exactly what happens. It's exactly what happens. So, so that's what they led me in. They said, they said you, you know, I could, get, I, I could, I could uh, repent, I could renounce, I could revoke, but I had to be willing to give back I had to be willing to give back anything the devil said I had gained, which was, which was basically undoing the trade that had been made in the first time or in the first place that created the covenant and the ownership. Is that making sense to you? So, so I did that. Now, I got to tell you, when they said to me, when they said to me, you got to give, you got to give it back. I'm like, there was like a spirit of, it's almost like a spirit of fear grabbed me inside because I thought, oh, well, what if, what if what the devils gave me I like? Because remember, you made the trade for protection. You made the, somebody made the trade for prosperity. Somebody made, I thought, well, what, what if, what if there's something that I've grown accustomed to that I don't want to give up? But then they told me this, and this made all the difference in the world. They said, they said, you need to give it back. You need to be willing to say, I give back anything it says I have gained. But then say this, I only want what Jesus has for me. And I thought, I can do that. Because I do only want what Jesus has for me. Because the truth of the matter is, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. No matter who claims they gave it to you, it came from God. So I was able to undo that whole issue and undo the covenant. Well, I gotta tell you, here's what happened. I mean, I knew something had shifted. I'm in South Africa, but I knew something had shifted. So I go home after I get through the meetings and I go home and when I get home after the meetings, I, 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 I'm, the Lord starts you know, speaking to me about the whole court of heaven because I never encountered it before. I didn't even know. I, I thought, I mean, nobody taught on it. They just did it. You had these, these levels of apostolic, but then you had these prophetic people that were so proficient that they could, they were seeing and understanding things. And, and I gotta say, they were able, and I knew things were moving in the spirit realm because I could feel it. And I thought, I don't know what this is, but it's, I can tell it's working. I can tell something's happening. So I went home, and sure enough, when I got home, I told my wife about what had happened, and, and God started speaking to me about the court of heaven. And later on, somebody was going to say, a prophetic person looked at me, and this is what they said. Let me tell you your main spiritual gifting. I said, I was in Switzerland with this guy, and I, I said, oh, okay. And he said, you're, he said, it's not going to sound exciting. He said, your main spiritual gift is understanding. He said, because this is what understanding is. It's able to connect this piece with this piece way up here. He said, you just intuitively know how to do that. I said, you're exactly right. I said, that's how I could piece together the understanding of the court of heaven. I could piece it all together from the, and I'm still piecing it together. But, but it comes out of, of just a gift of understanding. So I go home and I tell my wife, you know, this is what happens. And, and I remember, I didn't say a word to our children. Not a word. Because I thought they're not going to understand it. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to get it. Here's what happened. Every one of them started immediately snapping into divine order and leaving what, the, what they were doing to, for, to pursue the purposes of God in their life. Every one of them. Everyone, because this is what had happened. When I had broken the covenant with Parax, when I had undone that, it undid the ownership the enemy claimed over me 
and my family line for generations to come. So here's, here's and I'm just sharing that with you because, because as many times as I've been to Singapore, there's, there's so much, so often I hear people talking about, well, we're a believer, but our kids aren't. Or this one's not, or that one's not. And I'm like, God wants to break every covenant, every claim of the enemy because of covenant and free our families to come into the full destiny and purpose that's written in the books of heaven about them. Amen? I believe with all my heart that that's what he wants to do. So, so I wanted just to tell you that that particular story so that it would hopefully build faith in you because we watched our kids. So let me just give you this one illustration. So we got six. We have six kids. I know that's crazy, but that's what we got. I mean, it's like they're, they're, they're from like 44 down to 32 now. Well, here's the deal. I mean, they were, me I mean, they were messed up. I mean, they really were messed up. I mean, they were making stupid choices, doing stupid things. I'm trying to be, I'm actually being nice by saying that. Because I was like, what are you, what are you thinking? And, but one of my sons, his name is Adam. Um, it was so working against him. This, this thing was so working. He was in deep depression. He was in absolute deep depression. And he, and, and I, and I tried, I was trying to get him out of it. I was trying to, he wasn't a one person given to depression, but he had ended up in depression. So I was trying to get him out of this depression, I, but I couldn't get him out. I don't care what I told him. I don't care how much I encouraged him because see the re, because it wasn't it wasn't a emotional issue, it was a spiritual issue. Because something was claiming him and it was manifesting through this depression that was in his life. He had been a very successful youth pastor up in the northwest part of our of our country. But then his wife that he was married to decided she didn't want to be married and and have that life. So she left with, her with his two-year-old little daughter. That's what threw him into this entire situation. Well, I had prayed for Adam prior to understanding the courts. I had prayed for him like for two and a half years, maybe three, I can't remember. And I mean, nothing was working. He, things were getting worse and worse. I tell people I was binding, I was loosing, I was opening, I was shutting. I was doing everything I, that somebody had told me I needed to do. Every technique we had, I'd ever learned. Nothing was moving, nothing was changing. In fact, it was getting worse. And I remember after all those years of praying, I began to understand the courts just in a very um, uh, small way. And I went to prayer one morning, like I always did. And as I began to pray, instantly, the Lord said to me, bring Adam to my courts. Now, I'd never heard anything like that. And the truth is, I did thought, here's where my first thought, I don't know how to do that. I don't even, I don't know what that means. But I thought, I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Because, because the truth is, it is um, it's not working. The other things aren't working. It's only getting worse. So I just said, Lord, I just, I just by faith, best, best I understand, I bring Adam to your courts. And as I said that, I thought, well, I'll just repent in his behalf. Now, here's the deal. I didn't even know if that was right or not. I did not know if I could do something in behalf of Adam. I was going to find later 1 John 5, 16, that if you see one sinning a sin not unto death, you can ask life and God will give life to them. In other words, you have a right to represent people in the presence and in the courts of the Lord. It says you can, God will do it for you. He will do it for them because you ask. See, this is what Abraham did when the Bible says that he delivered Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because Abraham, not, not because of Lot, but because of Abraham. It was Abraham's standing before God that caused Lot to be delivered. So we literally have a right to do that. So, but I didn't know all that then. I didn't, I just thought, I don't know what else to do. So I said, Lord, I just come before you and I repent in behalf of my son, Adam. I repent in behalf of, of him. And I said, Lord, any failures, I remember I said, any failures he had as a husband or as a father, I repent in his behalf. Uh, and then anything else I felt, I just started repenting of it in his behalf. And as I'm repenting of it in his behalf, I felt things start to shift. 
Now, again, I didn't even know if that was theologically correct or not. I was just doing, doing something out of, out of the sense of not knowing yet what else to do. And so, then again, like I said, I found out later. And so I began to sense that. I began to sense something was moving. And, 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 and again, I found, this is what I tell people, my repentance in Adam's behalf did not cause him to be forgiven. Only his own repentance could do that. But my repentance in his behalf could revoke the devil's rights to use his sin against him. Okay, because I was standing as an advocate in the spirit world in behalf of my son and whatever place I had in God, it allowed me to do that. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so, so I did that. As soon as I got through repenting for him and in his behalf, here's what happened. I heard the Lord say, now you repent. And I said, and I literally thought, what have I done? And the Lord said this, I mean, instantly said this, said, you have spoken negative things about Adam to his mother, which I had. I had, in the privacy of mine and Mary's conversation, I don't know why, he knew better than this, he knew better than that, he should have done, he knows that. And this is what the Lord said, he said, when you said those things to his mother, he said, the enemy, the devil, grabbed your words, took them into the court of heaven, and said, even his own father says this about him. And now I knew I was the one. I was one, I was a big part of the problem. So I began to repent with tears streaming down my cheeks for having spoken negative words about Adam that the enemy had taken and was saying, his, his own father says this about him and, and used them against him. So I repented and I asked for God to forgive me. I asked for the words I had spoken to be annulled in the spirit world so that the enemy would no longer have a right to use them against Adam. Okay, so I did that. So as soon, I mean, it was like, it was like, bam, bam, bam. As soon as I did that, here's what happened. The Lord said to me, now prophesy his destiny. Now, I had no idea that God was leading me through a court, courtroom process. Because this is what you, I found out later, this is what you do. You come into the courts and you repent so that the blood of Jesus can speak in your behalf. Hebrews 12, 24. There is a blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. But, the, but, but 1 John 1, 7 says the way we get the effects of what the blood is saying is by walking in the light as he is in the light. And then we have fellowship one with each other. And the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us from all unrighteousness and all sin. So, so literally what was going on there was, was that whenever I was repenting, the blood was having a right to speak in my behalf because I'm walking in the light as he is in the light because I'm bringing hidden things, to, uh, uh, hidden things of darkness to light. I hope that's making sense. So I did that, and as I did that, then the Lord said to me, now prophesy his destiny because what I knew after the fact was that my repentance literally had 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 silenced the voices that were against Adam, watch this, but he now needed voices speaking for him. So the way that voices speak is because there is a, there is a uh, many times, a prophesying of the destiny and purpose of someone. So I began to prophesy Adam's destiny. On the day Adam was born, the Lord said this to me. I was sitting outside the room after Mary had had him, and I heard this strong word, and it said, how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those that bring good news. Well, a few days later, we took him to the church, because I, I dedicated him quick. We took him to the church, our pastor lifted him up, and the first words out of our pastor's mouth was, how beautiful upon the mountain or the feet of those that bring good news. I went to him after, I said, why did you say that? He said, because that's what God says about him. 
So here's what I did. I repented. The Lord said, prophesy his destiny. I said, Lord, you said how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those that bring good news. I declare this over Adam. And then anything else I felt, I just started prophesying. As I'm doing that, the spirit of the Lord says, now rebuke the spirit of depression. Now I had rebuked that spirit hundreds of times over several years. It had never moved. But now I look back and realize I had presented a case. There was now a judgment against that spirit. And so now I could stand and I said, I rebuke you, you spirit of depression. You will not have my son. I command you to let him go now. And I got up. It took about 15 minutes. And I got up. And I thought, now, I don't know what all that was, but something happened. It was so different from any other way I'd prayed over the course of two to three years. So I went on about business. A week and a half later, Adam called me. And he said, Dad, can I talk to you? Now, we never heard from him because he was just steeped in depression and kept himself hid away. And he said, Dad, can I talk to you? And I said, well, yeah. And this is what he said. I'll never forget. This is verbatim. He said, Dad, I don't know what happened, but a week and a half ago, all the depression left me, and I now want to serve God with all my heart. Can you help me? I said, well, yeah, I can help you. So I started helping. So, but here's the deal. Do you, so that was, that was way back in 20, 2010, 2011, I don't know, somewhere in there. You know where Adam is now? Adam ended up in a little town in Texas, I mean, it's a little town, it's like, it has like 3,500 people in it. It's called Canton, Texas. He took a church that had five people in it. Five people. That church now, there's 3,500 people in town. That church now is running 1,200 people. He's pastoring a third of the whole population of the whole town. And he and his and he's remarried and got two, two uh, got three total children. I mean, and e everything came to restoration. And Adam will tell you to this day the reason he is where he is was because his dad ended up in the court of heaven and was able to get a verdict in his behalf that set him free from depression, so he could come into the destiny that God had for him. Now, all of that, yes, Amen. All of that started. Here's why it started. Because I undid a covenant. I did, undid a covenant again that was, that was in my bloodline that was working against me and claiming my children for the enemy's sake rather than the purposes of God. How many of you would like to see your kids come free and come into the full destiny that God, if you would, would you stand up with me? And, and, and I'm just going to pray for everybody. So everybody just stand up, but let's just pray this prayer. Okay. Because listen, I could have, I could have walked through scriptures and I, but I'm telling you that to me, those kind of stories help illustrate maybe even more powerfully the whole issue of of what can happen in the court of heaven. Because listen, this thing changed my life. This thing changed my life. Are we gonna, have, yeah, I figured you were coming, thank you. Uh, this thing changed my life and it changed my family's life. And so we wanna pray right now. You know, you know, there's a man up in San Jose, California, David Kenneth Tracy. I don't know if the pastor knows him, but great guy. W wrote one of the first books on the apostolic. And this is what he says. I was talking to him on the phone and he said this to me. And I thought, what? He said, Robert, you've probably done more to fashion and form the prayer movement in the world in the last 10 years than anybody. And I thought, what? I thought, who am I? What am I? And all I could do is say, thank you, Lord, for the honor. If that's even half true, thank you for the honor of bringing your people into a new awareness of how to function in the unseen realms of the Spirit. Amen? So would you just say this? Say, Lord, as we stand before you today, we come before your courts. 
And we thank you today that we have access to your courts because of the blood of Jesus. That your blood, your blood of sprinkling is speaking better things than that of Abel. It's speaking a redemption, favor, forgiveness, restoration over me and my life and over my family. It's not speaking against me. It's speaking for me. And as I stand in your courts, Lord, I bring myself and my family, and I ask that any legal claim the enemy has against me because of any kind of a covenant with demon powers in my bloodline, let it be known that I repent. I repent for that, Lord. Let the enemy's legal rights be revoked. Lord, let it be known that I renounce it and I revoke it. But I also declare, Lord, that I give back. I give anything back that the devil says I have gained that would have created this covenant that would allow ownership. I give it back today. I say, I don't want anything that comes from the devil. I want only that which comes from you. I want your blessing, your favor, your grace, your prosperity. I want that upon my life. So as I stand before you, Lord, in this simple prayer, I'm asking that every covenant that the demons are using to claim me and my family would now be annulled, would now be revoked, would now be removed. I thank you for that right now as I stand before you in this place. And I ask that from the courts of heaven, there would be judgment against every devilish influence that would be influencing me or my family on every level. And according to your word, as we humble ourselves before God and resist the devil, he flees away and his rights are revoked. His rights are revoked right now. Now I just says, just lift your hands and just begin to worship him. Come on, just begin to worship him. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for this right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you for families being freed. Thank you for children being let go. Thank you for those that haven't served God. Thank you for the prodigals coming home, Lord. Thank you that the prodigals are coming home. That the prodigals are coming home. Thank you, Lord, that they're rising up from wherever they are. And they're coming home, Lord God. Because the rights against them have been revoked and have been removed. And we thank you for that. Even now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we pray children, grandchildren, and generations to come shall serve the Lord. Shall serve the Lord. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you give the Lord a great big praise?